Hello and welcome. I'm George Crump, Lead Analyst with Storage Switzerland. Thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to talk about uh, DRAS or Disaster Recovery as a Service and talk about it's a kind of an unusual aspect of DRAS compared to maybe other DR solutions is that you can really use the technology for much more than just disasters, uh, although those are of course important. Uh, joining me to help with the conversation, I've invited uh, Carla, Carla Fabrico. She is the Director of Marketing at Infrascale. Carla, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So before we get into the meeting presentation, uh, Carla, why don't you give the folks a little bit of background on both yourself and Infrascale? Great, thanks. Um, so again, my name is Carla Fedrigo. I'm the Director of Marketing at Infrascale. I've been at Infrascale for uh, about five years. And our company, our mission here at Infrascale is to eradicate downtime and data loss. So very simple mission, and we're doing this with a 15-minute failover guarantee. Um, nobody else in the industry currently offers this guarantee. And all the info that I'm going to share with you has been verified and vetted by Gartner. We were named a 2017 Gartner leader in the DRAS Magic Quadrant. Great, thank you, Carla. Uh, and for those that don't know me, I am George Crump, founder and lead analyst of Storage Switzerland. Uh, prior, we've actually uh, had that company now for 10 years. Uh, prior to founding Storage Switzerland, I worked in uh, various data centers for over 25 years designing uh, all kinds of different infrastructure items, uh, specifically as it relates to today, uh, a lot of backup and disaster recovery uh, type of efforts. So, uh, Carla, you know, I, I thought a really good place to start would be just to kind of look, take a high-level view of things and look, let's just talk about the state of data center threats. and. Timing is an interesting thing. Uh, you know, we, you and I were talking about this yesterday, but uh, when we started this effort, uh, a lot of the focus was going to be on stuff other than major disasters, and then two or three big storms in the in the Gulf sort of reprioritized things. And, and I think it really, though, sort of crystallized the fact that you can never take your eye off of any of the balls, right? That you've always got to be pre sort of prepared for everything. And, and I like to break uh, disasters down into kind of three categories, right? There's, there's major disasters, which are really top of mind again with the recent hurricanes. And, you know, uh, as we've uh, spoken on prior webcasts, you know, certainly our hearts go out with those, to, to those folks and uh, we're available to help in any way possible. Um, but, but those are things that are uh, once in a lifetime thing. In fact, you know, these storms, uh, it really is about a 12 year gap in between the last set of these, uh, major catastrophic uh, type of events and what we've seen uh, so far this um, late summer and fall. Um, but that's something you've really got to still pay attention to, even though the chances of you getting impacted by a disaster uh, are small, the, the ramifications of you getting hit are pretty large, aren't they, Carla? Right. So I think that with these recent storms, we're all realizing that, that everyone's at risk, and whether it be one of these macro um, type disasters or even just those micro disasters, the things that can happen every day, um, I think that it's just in really critical to, to always be prepared for, for that sort of impending disaster. Um, I, I know we haven't gotten to it quite yet because here we're going to touch on ransomware on this slide as well. Um, you know, we've all, we've all seen those headlines when it, when it comes to these types of, of threats. So um, really, we're, we're all at risk. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I was doing some research on the impact of uh, Hurricane Harvey, and the coverage area there was 28,000 square miles uh, were uh, impacted by it. So I don't know how many businesses would be represented in 28,000 square miles, but I bet you it's more than two. And, and so these are, you know, but I, I think the thing, the key takeaway here, uh, and I want to spend a little bit of time on minor disasters, is don't get don't design a solution based on today's headlines, right? I mean, because if we did that in May, you would have bought a ransomware product, and this week you'd be buying a disaster recovery product. What you really need is sort of a holistic solution that will cover these sort of major events, headline grabbing deals. And, and you know, that middle of that slide, I think, is really important. These are the, the minor disasters. They don't ever get any headlines, but boy, they can give you a lot of head, headaches, uh, right? I mean, the um, I got to remember that line too, by the way. Um, 
but the you know a, a server failure probably only impacts your organization and maybe even a subgroup of people in the organization but uh, it, it is something, you know, we may call it a minor disaster, but if you're the guy dealing with recovering the server, it's kind of major to you, right? Exactly. And it's so critical to know that, that when you are putting that solution in place for it, not all solutions are created equal. So I know we'll get to it later, but um, really just knowing all of the, the pieces of, you know, functionality that you want to take into consideration when you're putting a solution in place so that when you actually do need it, it's there for you and it's actually working the way that you expect it to. Yeah, exactly. So we, we could spend an hour probably just on this slide, but let's, let's kind of move on and talk about some other stuff. I, I think the other thing is that I see a lot in um, disaster recovery planning is there is this focus on sort of the major disaster, and I, I call it sort of headline chasing, right? We all get guilty of the sort of the, 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 the threat of the day, so to speak. And, and so what we see as a result of that is a, a lot of times I see organizations focusing just on getting the copy from point A to point B or from your primary data center to the secondary site, uh, whether it be the cloud or, or something you own or something. I, I uh, call it a couple weeks ago, actually probably three now, I was literally speaking to a guy that had a, uh, a car full of hard drives driving, trying to find a location to start getting them recovered, and he wanted my help. But I'm like, wow, I don't, could you have called me three oh months gosh. ago? Because that could have been, right. <laughs> you know, and so right. I actually tried to, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, I just like, I appreciate the problem, but gee whiz. And, and so that's a, that's a challenge. So it's more than, in his case, at least getting the copy to the data center would actually have been an improvement. But I mean, you got to get out of the mindset of it's, it's not just the data. The, you're going to have to do some compute work to it, right? And I think a big one here, and we're going to be talking a lot about disaster recovery as a service, but I think where a big fundamental change is really in that second bullet is start to pay attention for how long the recovery is going to take, right? So getting data from point A to point B, with the exception of my poor guy that called me, is, is, is almost table stakes now, right? Getting it somewhere else shouldn't be that hard, uh, or maybe it's hard, but it's doable. It's really, once it's there, how quickly can you do something with it, right? Yeah, and it sounds like that poor guy was was definitely using, you know, one, one of those traditional uh, approaches to backup and recovery, and we're, we're learning more and more that those approaches simply don't work any longer. Um, that's where we're we're headed more and more towards a drive solution and i didn't i didn't define it when we started um started this webcast but for anyone who's new to draz it's it it stands for disaster recovery as a service so it's going to replicate and protect your entire environment not just the files and folders um so that's going to let you quickly fail over your systems and ensure uptime and availability so that poor guy with all the disks uh disk drives in his car you know how Think of how long is that going to take for him to recover any of that data and then test it for viability. And if it's not viable, go back and, you know, start all over again. So uh, DRAZ is definitely a, a, quicker, um, a quicker solution than that. We'll get into the details later, though. Yeah, I was going to say, for those that don't know DRAZ, we're going to talk about that in some detail in the next slide. Uh, the other thing that we find uh, that usually breaks most, there's two things that I find that breaks most uh, disaster recoveries. Uh, one is lack of testing, right, and the other is lack of people. Uh, the, 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 you know, and I think Hurricane Harvey is, is a really good example, and I think what we're seeing that right now with uh, uh, Hurricane Irma is, is people by, you know, and probably for really good reason, are going to go take care of their own stuff, right? And so having a facility that's far enough away that the people that would uh, access it uh, and execute the recovery process um, aren't impacted by this uh, really becomes critical. But I, I think the big thing, and again, picking on the guy driving around Houston, but uh, you know, it, what he was lacking obviously was a test, right? Because he, he never tested this uh, approach. And so knowing what to do when the worst case happens is super critical because you're under pressure. You've got other things to worry about. You've got just crazy stuff going on and so making sure that, that you can test it. And really, I think another big one that I don't have mentioned here, Carla, 
is simplicity. You, you don't want to have to be opening up a manual and reading, you know, 30 pages of step-by-step -step instructions. You want to essentially be able to push a button and have things start working, right? Right, right. And so, and testing used to be what a really lengthy process, and so that's why it was only done, you know, maybe once a year. And so, we definitely we encourage our customers to test as often as they can. We don't we don't limit to how many tests tests they run. Um, so that's something that you really need to take into consideration again when you look at sort of how all solutions are are created differently. Um, no matter no matter what type of draft solution you have, you really want to ensure that you're able to test as often as needed, and like you said, quickly and easily, just the push of a button. Yeah, exactly. And I think the big one that is um, something that we need to spend a lot more time on as an industry is is sort of what the return to normalcy looks like, right? Because if you do have the the type of disaster that means you're leaving your data center for some reason. Generally, the, the the range of that time is anywhere from, you know, just a few hours to, you know, again, uh, citing her, Hurricane Harvey and Irma, potentially weeks, if not months, right? And in some cases, maybe never. Um, so, understanding what it's going to take to get back to that primary data center once it's rebuilt, dried out, whatever the case may be, uh, and how you're going to manage through that process is also a really uh, critical component of the overall disaster recovery process. So I think that's something that, Carla, I really encourage people to uh, spend some time on, you know, getting it to point A to point B. Testing is important, but also knowing how you're going to get out uh, also becomes a, a, a key component as well, right? Yes, I can't agree more with that, and I, I couldn't even emphasize enough how critical it, it is to to know what type of customization and control you have in that fail back because yes you need to be able to fail over your applications and systems and if you're if you're in the midst of a disaster then the last thing you want to worry about is you know do i have the the did i put the policies in place correctly do i have the right procedures you don't want to think about that there are obviously other things that you need to be considering so once you're in that failover environment being able to to run in that failover environment as long as is necessary until the disaster passes, and then being able to fail back and have those incremental changes come back as well, Re really critical. I couldn't even emphasize enough how important that fail back is as well. Cool. So then let's, you know, we've been touching around the edges of DRAS. Um, uh, Carl, let's kind of deep dive a little bit on it here. Um, you know, obviously the focus of our webinar today is to talk about what else you can do with it, but um, the, I think it's a key to understand sort of the components. So, and, and you mentioned this, right? Data is regularly copied to another location, um, and, and I think I put it in all caps for a reason. Uh, it has compute resources. I think that's a fundamental shift in the way many disaster recovery sites uh, were designed with the exception of the sort of the uh, you know, Fortune 100 type of companies, but most DR sites for you know medium size and large businesses, the data was there and the plan was maybe to ship in um, compute when needed. Uh, the, the big difference here with DRAS is the compute is there and probably also as important, you're not necessarily paying for that uh, compute until you turn it on and use it. That's a fundamental shift in the in the way we set up a DR site to know that we have access to compute anytime we need it, right? Exactly. And moving those compute resources to where the data sits is what's going to, uh, you know, uh, allow you to, to spin up an environment in just seconds rather than uh, minutes, weeks, months, like we mentioned earlier. Exactly. Uh, you know, and, and so I think that recovery key piece is key. But I, I think the big one for me is this, the, the, the testing. And, I, and I, I will find, and I know you guys, will, you'll talk about this in detail on your product, but and I find this to be a key differentiator uh, between different um, DRAS vendors is how simple it is to do that recovery effort or to do a test. Uh, you know, and if you can get it down to you know, something like a push button sort of thing, I think you're going to be much more uh, 
willing, for lack of a better word, to do the task because you know it's not going to take the rest of your week uh, or your weekend uh, to perform. So that that testing is, I, I think, super critical to make sure that, you know, in, in the worst case, you have something to do, right? Yep, completely agree. And then finally, I think the um, the return to primary, uh, you know, again, we, we talked about this, and I think we're both in agreement here, but that getting back to primary is important. Um, you have to look at how you're going to do that and understand. And I think this is another key differentiator that I see in various uh, DRAD solutions is how they uh, help you, if you will, get back to your primary uh, facility Se seems to vary pretty greatly between the different solutions, right? It, it really does. That is one of the critical questions to ask any solution. Um, you know, b before you get on board. So you, you definitely want to know how much control you have over that failback. Um, a lot of solutions will also be, be charging you, you know, additional costs depending on how long you're in that failover environment um, and, and adding additional fees on top of that as well. So it's really, really important to just ask all the details, make sure that you're aware upfront of what all of the policies and procedures are that that, that solution has to ensure that, you know, if you are in a disaster situation, all you, all you want to be um, concerned about is how to, how to recover from that disaster situation, but not all of those nitty gritty details. If you ask those questions ahead of time in advance, then you're good to go at that point. Yeah, exactly. Um, for, and actually, you just reminded me of a, a piece that I wrote about a year or two ago on the five questions to ask your drag vendor, and that was the final question is, right. uh, how do I get back, right? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, that was a great I'll put a piece. link in yeah, there. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so, um, so I think that that kind of gives you a good overview of what DRAZ is uh, and, and why we tend to really like it. Um, so let's talk about how this applies to minor disasters, so, uh, you know, kind of moving the conversation from major disasters. So, again, to remind uh, you know, minor disasters are a server failure, some sort of an application bug, although I know that developers never make a mistake, um, or corruption, uh, or a storage, uh, storage system failure. Um, it, it's, it's only minor uh, because of the scope of the disaster, right, in, in that unlike, say, a Hurricane Harvey, it's, it's not impacting 28,000 miles, right? It's a, a, impacting you and, and, in many cases, not even your own um, uh, not even your your entire data center, right? It could be a, a single server or, or something like that. So that scope varies uh, from uh, organization to organizations. Um, and, and then finally, what I what I find that I and we've seen this really with uh, Harvey and Irma is you know if your business is on CNN underwater, uh, people suddenly become much more patient with you, right? Now I don't necessarily recommend that as a way to get around uh, a good disaster recovery plan. But it's these minor ones that will get you in trouble because it's not impacting a wide scope of people and people become much less patient. And, and so this is something, uh, Carla, that I really see people in, the, in these kind of annoyance sort of disasters, um, they expect IT to be able to recover very, very quickly, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's not surprising that, that that's the case because uh, not surprising to anyone, 75% of disasters are these, you know, hardware failures, uh, human error, software failure. If you combine um, all of those instances, then that's roughly about 90 to 95% or more of disasters. And so when you're taking that into consideration and you're looking at the cost of downtime associated with those minor disasters, it's simply not worth the cost. Even a small, small to medium-sized business being down for, for just an hour is going to cost tens of thousands of dollars. The average cost per hour of downtime um, is over $200,000 per hour. So uh, yes, we wanna have that, you know, that quick recovery within seconds or minutes. We wanna be right back to that production environment. Yeah, and I, and I think that, you know, again, we've been hitting testing pretty hard, but this is one of the areas where testing becomes so important because you have to understand how much data you're going to lose, how long it's going to take you to reposition things, all those variables, and that's what you learn and, frankly, get better at as you go through uh, testing. So then let's let's talk about, 
you know, again, I'm a, obviously a big fan of uh, Draz as a concept. You know, it, it makes minor disasters minor. And I think one of the big things is um, is Draz makes or creates more frequent backups. Most, uh, uh, or well, I should say most, uh, many Draz solutions will back up every 15 uh, to 30 minutes. And that compared to especially like a standard backup, that, that provides a, a pretty low uh, RPO and RTO uh, uh, for the organization, right, Carla? Right. Um, so with, with that 15-minute incremental, then, you know, worst, worst case scenario is that you've lost that, you know, 15 minutes of data. And as, as much as we would all love to be very responsible computer users, we're human and we make errors. So, you know, we, we break, we lose, we drop our devices, we accidentally delete data, we fall prey to ransomware. But with, with that 15 minute um, recovery point and a 15 minute recovery time objective, um, you know, that, then we're, we're back to, to where we were in, in just minutes. Yeah, and I find the, the, the frequent backup very interesting because it, it was sort of the, the limitation of the cloud that forced uh, companies like yours to innovate, to come, or, to come up with a way to get, you know, backups across a very thin um, pipe, right? Well, and as a result of that technology that you guys developed, now you're able to do, you know, essentially on-premise backups very, very quickly, which means you can then replicate them to the cloud quickly. So it's, it's, it's good how that sort of move to the cloud actually drove on-premise innovation to an extent. Um, so the, the other thing is that the application can start up within minutes. Uh, and so and I want to tie in that, the, that final bullet there, it is not all solutions, or all, especially in minor disasters, you don't always want to fail over to the cloud unless you really have to. And so these minor disasters, it might make more sense to fail over local. And I, I know that you guys are one of the leaders in providing a vehicle to, to do that as well, right, Carla? Mm -hmm. So if you have that, that ability and that option to have a local on-premise appliance, then you can, of course, fail over to that appliance. Um, or fail over to the cloud. So you have that, that control and you have that, that choice and that option. Um, having that on-premise appliance as well, you capture all of the data there and then you replicate it to the cloud. So you have two copies of that data at all times. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that, that's a huge uh, advantage. And, and frankly, you know, takes care of some of the fail back conversation that we were having because obviously if all you had to do was fail locally, you don't have to even worry about uh, how the internet and things like that would uh, would impact you. So uh, a big takeaway there is, you know, Draz just makes these minor disasters exactly what they should be, as, as minor and allow you to recover uh, relatively quickly. Now, Carla, the other big headline grabber, of course, is ransomware. Um, you know, it's uh, we haven't talked about it much lately because of the, the hurricanes, but I'm sure all, we're just one attack away from it becoming a high-profile thing again. Um, and, and just to kind of summarize, you know, ran ransomware essentially uh, corrupts or encrypts uh, files uh, on a network. Uh, it generally infects the organizations by through the users uh, by them typically clicking on suspicious emails or downloading the wrong type of file, things like that. Um, and, and you know, I always like to point out here: these are not the the, the uh, purveyors of these uh, uh, software. Uh, are not the guys that used to send poorly written emails, you know, with from a prince in a faraway land that had ten million dollars in gold, and all you had to do was send him a million dollars in cash to get to it. I mean, these. I, I mean, I, I get one. I got one the other day from an online um, uh, retailer, and it looked because I order from that retail all the time. It, I almost clicked on it because it looked like something that would come from them. And, and so I had to go back and look at the address and everything. But these things, these guys are pretty clever. And I think it's because of the amount of money these guys are making uh, on these this um, this effort, right? I mean, people are paying the ransom. Exactly. They're, they're, they're getting more sophisticated as well. So the, the other growing problem with ransomware, too, is the, the recent introduction of ransomware as a service. 
So that makes ransomware accessible to anyone, and it's really lowered the barrier to entry for ransomware. So anyone can get their hands on it, and then uh, now negotiating uh, negotiating is, is almost a business in and of itself, uh, negotiating the ransom. So right. you see um, websites that have popped up, um, you know, cu- customer service lines that have popped up to help uh, the process walking through paying the Bitcoin and paying that ransom. So it's, it's a, a growing problem. Um, definitely we're going to see more of these threats. Yeah, I, you know, think about it. If, if, if you're an IT professional uh, listening to this, um, any employee that leaves and is disgruntled uh, has the potential to infect you with ransomware. I mean, that's as simple as it gets. Uh, and so that's, that's a real, and they don't have to know. Frankly, the, the ransomware as a service uh, subject is probably one worth its own webinar, but um, it, it, it literally, you don't need to know much about technology to become a ransomware expert. So it's kind of scary. Um, so the other big, the, the thing is, though, of course, the encryption happens during the middle of the day. This is not something that conveniently happens after your backup. In fact, we've seen some strains purposely look for when the last backup was done and wait as long as possible before it encrypts. Another thing I ran into recently, Carlo, was a, a strain that only encrypted a little bit a day because, as you know, there's some detection tools out there that look for X amount of files changing in a given period of time, and so what they were trying to do is stay below that number. So these guys are getting, you know, frankly, quite creative. And what we're seeing as as sort of a decision point for many uh, organizations is, do I pay the ransom because, you know, in theory, I instantly get my uh, access to my data, or do I recover? And if you haven't gone through this Here comes that testing word again. If you don't know how long it's going to take you to recover a few hundred thousand files, uh, you know, you might make a business decision, not maybe a great one, um, to pay the ransom. And, and, and that really becomes, the, to me, the tipping point is you've got to have a recovery solution that can recover files fast enough or put you back in business fast enough that paying the ransom seems silly, right? Exactly. I agree. So I think that so let's talk about how Draz fits into that. I think the um, you know again it it really makes uh, life, if you will, uh, much easier. It, it, you know, and, and it's funny these foundational things just sort of uh, permeate uh, throughout. So that that it comes back to being able to do those frequent backups, uh, and then also the data can be easily copied back, or in a worst case scenario. Uh, the Draz appliance can actually host, you know, the example I used here was a file server, just like it would uh, host anything else. So now one of the things that is important, I think you guys have spent some time on, Carla, if I'm not mistaken, is you guys have spent some time on detection and identifying the the best, if you, if you will, or last known good copy prior to encryption, right? That's right. And that goes into what we made a really brief mention of early on is just the fact that not all solutions are created equal. So there are going to be various ways to back up and recover critical systems and data. Um, All organizations have very different security requirements and compliance requirements. And, you know, there are different levels of flexibility and backup targets and recovery options and, um, and we already did kind of make a brief mention of the need to control failback procedures, and, and we'll talk about orchestration policies. So, you know, I'll get into to some of the details in, in just a minute uh, later on in this webinar, but it's just very critical to understand um, not all solutions are created equal, and you want to make sure that you know exactly how your solution is going to be, is going to be working so that you know whether or not it's the right solution for you. Exactly. So... You know, this slide, I actually wanted to have a, uh, a picture of the guy, the, the, that um, infomercial pitch guy, that's saying, but wait, there's more. Um, and, 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 you know, we'll talk about some of these use cases real quickly, but you can do laptop, laptop protection with this. You can use it to help with data migration, data center modernization, uh, managing service windows, all those different things. But again, I think the key concept that we've sort of hit pretty well here is it all builds on this foundation of being able to do instant backups, 
uh, being able to do some form of instant recovery on, a, on an appliance or on a cloud. Or, or, and, and really, you can think about this is you're, you're putting that data to work, right? Where in the past, uh, disaster recovery has always sort of been this insurance policy. Um, and, and I kind of equate it to, and I just came up with this last night, Carlos, so don't laugh at me if you don't like it, but it's sort of like the difference between putting money into a savings account or a mutual fund, right? The, the savings account, you're going to earn pennies in interest, but I guess it's safe. Well, it is safe. Uh, in the mutual fund, it's yeah. you know, historically just as safe, and you're going to make a lot more interest on it. So that you're, you know, the term we always hear is you're putting your money to work for you. It's the same thing here. This, this insurance copy of data now, because of some of the capabilities that Draz has, is now you can put that, that, that copy, if you will, to work, right? And so let's kind of drill in quickly to some of the use cases. So one of the ones, and I wrote a piece about this just recently, but you can really use uh, uh, Draz for data center modernization, so the ability to shift uh, windows and things like that. Uh, and then I, I think the big one is for maintenance and service window. Um, the uh, and what I'm what I'm talking about there is so with the, that on-prem appliance, Carl. I you know I, I assume we could do something like if I need to upgrade uh, a server, I can fail to the appliance for a little bit, do my maintenance on that server, yep. and then flip back exactly. to it, right? Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Or I could use that appliance or the cloud uh, to do a test or a DevOps type of thing. Uh, talk a little bit about how this can help with uh, some compliance issues. Uh, so when it comes to compliance, it, it really is going to, to depend on what type of regula regulatory uh, compliance issues you have. So um, again, the, the type of issue that comes up where all solutions are not created equal. Um, but when it comes to the InfraScale solution, you know, it, we're, we're HIPAA compliant, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, PCI, Safe Harbor, SSA 16, CGIS, many, many other regulations as well. So that's the, the type of question that you want to ask your provider, you know, how is the data encrypted, where is it going to be stored, and really understand that if, if that solution is going to address the compliance issues that your company has. Yeah, exactly. And then the final one is, is, is an interesting one, too, the, the ability to – there's no reason why the, the agent that you guys use uh, uh, can't be deployed on a laptop to provide – now, obviously, we're not going to do full laptop startup there, uh, but just the ability to get that data protected and uh, uh, cover loss protection and things like that. I mean, all that has a, a lot of value uh, as well. Uh, so th that gives you, hopefully, some ideas on – where uh, DRAZ is, obviously we want to spend a little bit more time than we had originally planned on the, the major disasters. But I think the key thing that I take away from this, Carla, is the fact that we really are dealing with a, a, a holistic effort that I'm not going out and buying a solution for a flood and then a different solution when my server goes down and then another solution for ransomware and another solution for to do test dev or maintenance and things like that. It, this is one uh, uh, solution that can kind of do the whole thing. So why don't you uh, take the folks through sort of what your you guys can do and how you would fit into that conversation. Great. All right. Sounds good. So here what we're looking at first is um, I, I'm going to talk specifically about how InfraScale DRAS works. I'm going to talk about, you know, what items are important to take into consideration when you're selecting a DRAS provider. And, and this Gartner slide, I mentioned it early on, but you don't have to take my word for it because everything that I'll share with you has, you know, been verified by Gartner. So the experts have looked at it, and they named us a 2017 uh, leader in DRAS. In 2016, we were Gartner visionary in disaster recovery as a service. And in 2015, we were a cool vendor. So you'll see, you see that that momentum that we're gaining, you know, our approach is really getting a lot of attention. Um, so if we look at, I'm just going to the next slide here. So if we look at the difference between um, backup and DRAS, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page here, which is why I want to go through this first. So when you're dealing with any type of outage or threat, you know that time is your worst enemy when it comes to disaster, right? 
So the faster that you can act on it, um, the more time you're going to have um, after, you know, after the event. So simple backup procedures are listed across the top here. If we look at, at the comparison, with a backup solution, you're, you're looking at four to five hours as your best case scenario. And that's sort of the reality of the best case. And of course, like we already mentioned and, and realized, it can take much, much longer than that. And so part of the reason is when it comes to restoring applications and production databases from a backup, it requires a lot of that planning and coordination in advance. So you have to find a clean point from which to restore, you know, then get that hardware to recover, um, set up the machine, recover the data, test it. If it's not viable, sort of start that process over again before restoring to production. But let's take a look at the bottom half of the screen. This is a DRAS solution. So with DRAS, you can simultaneously cloud boot multiple versions of the same machine. That way you can determine a safe version to recover and then boot either to the cloud, um, a virtual environment, or recover to production hardware. So the total downtime there is about one to two minutes. And so you can see it's saving a ton of time and you're saving a lot of money because of the simplicity of those steps. And with the Infrascale solution, I'll, I'll show you guys in just a minute, we also include a built-in failover orchestration. Um, and that lets you create predetermined failover plans. So they can be scheduled to boot simultaneously or in a specific order. And that way, you have complete control over the failover and also the failback. But rather than just sort of talk through um, the differences here, I want to give you a, a, an example, an actual example of, of a DRAS solution. So DRAS is going to support DR to be on demand, just the push of, push of a button. So here's a scenario where you have these end users here just working, um, you know, working on their production systems. And we're going to install uh, the Infrascale disaster recovery solution. So it's a hybrid cloud solution. You have an on-premise failover appliance that's installed locally. And this might be a virtual appliance or it might be a physical appliance. And then you also have a cloud-based service like would run on any public or private cloud, right? So we capture those systems on the appliance, we dedupe them to compress the amount of data that's stored, and then we replicate them to the cloud and have two copies of those systems. So here's a, a situation where if one system were to go down, then the admin could fail over to the local appliance and bring back the most recent point, a replica of that system, and then users continue working with that application or that as for that server. So now let's assume there's a site-wide attack, a site-wide outage, um, one of those hurricanes or floods. So the local appliance is no longer available. But that's okay. We're going to use the exact same steps here. We're going to roll back to that clean environment and we're going to fail over instead to the cloud. So we'll bring up a full virtual environment that replicates exactly what was on premise. And then now those end users continue working by interacting with those cloud-based systems. And so this is, this is essentially um, the, the easiest way to, to explain that whole system, right? So Infrascale offers a cloud DRAS solution. And all backups are replicated off-site to allow a much faster recovery, um, either on-premise or cloud-based recovery, of entire machines so that your users can continue to work while that production environment is repaired. So I mentioned briefly orchestration, but I wanted to come back to that and show you how our orchestration system works. And this is one of the key differentiators in any um, disaster recovery provider, right? 
So with orchestration, you want the orderly recovery of a server environment. And orchestration is going to ensure that all those critical servers, applications, and devices all come online in the proper sequence based on dependencies. So this is um, one of our releases from last year. It's a visual designer for drag and drop orchestration functionality. And this is right within our dashboard, within our boot tab. You see a page for orchestration, and then along the left here, you see a list of all the bootable machines, and you can simply drag them over to the diagram design surface. And then from there, you can rearrange them with the drag and drop. You can add wait times if you want to add delays between those boots. Um, you can create boot groups to run if some machines are more critical than others and you want to separate them that way. And then you can also specify network configuration settings for these machines. So there's the, the LAN configuration button there as well where you can specify the subnet, gateway, DNS servers, DHCP range. You can there enable or disable outbound internet access. So this is really critical functionality. No matter what DR solution you choose, it's really important to just understand exactly how that solution plans to fail over your applications and then fail back in addition to how much of that customization and control you have over the whole process. So I also want to share with you the two services that InfraScale offers. We have InfraScale Cloud Backup and InfraScale Disaster Recovery. Now, Cloud Backup, it's, it's a direct-to-cloud solution, mostly oriented around data and bare metal image backup. And this is typically for endpoint data protection for the laptops, those mobile devices, tablets. And then it's really optimized for small to medium businesses as well as those remote or branch offices. Now, InfraScale Disaster Recovery, take a look at the right-hand side here of the screen. It's a hybrid cloud solution that includes that on-prem component like we just saw, as well as the cloud. So here, of course, you can back up data, but it goes a step further in capturing full system images and allowing you to boot and run those images um, you know, either on the, on the local appliance or in the cloud, depending on what you need. And we've already done all the work behind the scenes in order to prepare those images and ensure that they're able to run in the cloud, even though they were originally installed and running on a local physical server. So just a couple more slides here, and then we'll jump into the Q&A, where I wanted to share the specifics. Just taking a look at everything that we do and what we can support. We protect any device, be it a desktop, laptop, um, across both Windows and Mac, any mobile devices, iPhones, Androids, even including some MDM functionality, uh, which is mobile device management, like geolocate, remote wipe, that, of course, comes into play. Uh, George mentioned earlier an example of, you know, a disgruntled employee that leaves the company, for example. So you want to have that um, geolocate and remote wipe capability as well. We do protect servers, both physical and virtual. Taking a look here, uh, we support servers running Windows, Unix, and Linux. And we support servers on VMware, Hyper-V, and KVM. We, we support more than 100 operating systems. So really, that's the broadest support footprint that you can find in the industry today. And then when it comes to recovery targets, we support uh, any cloud or a prepackaged appliance as well. So when I say any cloud, what I mean by that is you can use one of InfraScale's uh, 16 global data centers, or you can use your own private cloud or any uh, third-party cloud. So our software is going to run with Amazon Web Services, uh, Google Cloud, Windows, Azure, and IBM. Now, this last slide that I would like to share with everyone is essentially you know, just, just showing you that with InfraScale, we're going we're gonna to put our money where our mouth is. And so 
Um, this is the actual recovery times for InfraScale protected systems. And this is published live on our website. It's our cloud boot histogram. And what this does is it shows historical data for the actual recovery time for every system protected by InfraScale disaster recovery. And you can see on the dates shown, um, essentially each date on the x-axis, there's a green or a red bubble. And what this is showing you is the green bubble is representing systems successfully recovered, and any red bubble is showing sy systems that were not recovered. They didn't boot up successfully. If there's no bubble on that day, then it just means there were no systems recovered on that day. And then the size of that bubble is going to correspond to the number of systems that were recovered. So that position on the y-axis is going to show here's the average time that it took. And if we're looking at the time here, this is zero to two minutes, just to give you an idea. Um, I know it's printed a bit small in case you can't, can't read that. It's zero to two minutes um, along that y-axis. So on our website, you can also mouse over each bubble and see the actual number of systems that were um, recovered as well as the average recovery time. So just to give you a quick idea, that largest bubble towards the left, that represents 65 cloud boots at an average of one minute recovery time. And then if you average all of the remaining boots that you see here, it comes to about 12 seconds. So not only do we meet our 15 minute guarantee, but we, we, we can quite often uh, beat that guarantee and we publish this live on our website for everyone to view. All right. So moving on from here, before we get to the q and I'm going to pass it back over to you, George. Okay, thanks, Carl. I appreciate that uh, rundown. Um, so before we get to the questions, I'm going to give uh, Carla a, a chance to prioritize a couple of them. Um, so a uh, question always comes up is, will it be an on-demand version? The answer is yes. Uh, it will probably be ready in about two or three minutes when we're done uh, this particular webcast. Uh, on the uh, upper right hand side of your player, there's an email uh, button and you can actually email a link of the web to the on-demand webinar to a friend or colleague uh, that you think might be uh, interested in the subject. Certainly appreciate that. I'm sure an email from you is more valuable than an email from me. Uh, also, uh, there's attachments associated with this uh, webinar, actually quite a bit. Uh, so you click on the attachments button that's at the bottom of your player. Uh, you'll see a bunch of different uh, articles and things that uh, both uh, we and InfraScale have written, so feel free to take full advantage of those. And then finally, when you're done uh, listening to today's webinar, uh, go ahead and provide us some feedback, what you thought, uh, you know, what you think is uh, the, uh, uh, you know, what you thought of the thing. There's a feedback section in there. You can go ahead and type in uh, answers uh, or, or comments there. We always like those as well. Uh, so Carla, are you game for a couple of questions here? Yeah, sounds good. Let's okay. dive in. I, I got to take this one first because I think it's funny. Um, can you do dual? Can you do dual cloud? Replicate to a private cloud and then to a public cloud, and you put in there. I'm extra paranoid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yes, you can. Um, that's a great question, and I and I understand um, that worry as well. You know, the the paranoia or the worry, however you'd like to put it. But um, yes, you can. So when it comes to replication, I, I agree with you. You know, when it comes to critical data, you can never have enough copies. Yeah, and if you're in backup recovery or disaster recovery planning, you can never be too paranoid. So no, no, uh, no harm there at all. Uh, so yeah. next question. And just, to, just to let them know. Well, just to let them know as well, we replicate. So just to, to let you know how redundant our data centers are, we replicate to another machine uh, within the same data center in case in case uh, that cluster goes down. And then we also replicate to another data center in a different state or geographic region, you know, in the event of a problem at that data center. So there's that. And then also most of our customers do keep a replicated copy. So, you know, redundancy is generally not an issue there. Exactly. Uh, so another good yeah. question, uh, you had mentioned how many data centers you guys have. And, and so the question is, where are they? Yes. Yeah. 
That's a great question. Um, so we, we have uh, 16 uh, globally dispersed data centers. Um, they're going to be located in North America, in uh, Canada. We have uh, data centers in the UK, uh, South Africa, South America, um, Europe. I think I, I hit most of the regions there. And then if you want more specifics on, you know, which states or which, um, you know, which, which specific areas, then I can also address that. Okay, cool. Uh, so, uh, Carla, why don't you go ahead and uh, prioritize a few more questions. Uh, I do want to put up on the screen some contact information, so if you guys need additional information, uh, all the stored Switzerland information is on the left-hand side. Uh, you can reach out to us via any of those channels, uh, and then the InfraScale uh, contact information is on the right-hand side. Uh, if you are an on-demand viewer and you do have some questions, uh, we don't want you to feel left out, so feel free to tweet us questions. We're pretty good about getting right after those there. Uh, so that's that one. Um, uh, it, here's a good one, I think. Uh, uh, here's um, I, what uh, happens if the on-site appliance fails? Uh, can backups redirect to the cloud until it's replaced? Great question, and um, I, so that's something to address that that I actually didn't didn't talk to you on our slides is that you have uh, complete control over all of these policies and procedures. So you're able to set these procedures up as is going to work work best for your company. In addition to um, having complete access to our dashboard. Um, where you can log into that dashboard from any browser, even if you're on a tablet, a laptop, or a smartphone. So, you know, if, if this disaster to happen at 2 a.m. on a Saturday and, uh, you know, you wake up in, in the middle of the night, you have your, your laptop or even a smartphone at, at, on your bedside stand, you can log into the dashboard in just a few clicks and you're able um, to fail over to wherever you need to. Okay. Uh, let's see, are you HIPAA compliant? Yes, we are. Um, we also sign uh, business associate agreements, and we take security very seriously, so all of our data centers do comply with um, HIPAA, CGIS, uh, PCI, SSA 16, many other regulations as well. Um, our data is encrypted at a 256-bit AES locally, it's sent over an SSL, and then it's encrypted again at 256-bit AES uh, at rest. So if you are subject to any of those regulatory frameworks, then you know, do make sure that the vendor you choose has that compliance factor built in. Yeah, that, those are, that's super critical. You know, I, one of the things that I always uh, advise people, like I said, I have these sort of five questions to ask, and one of them is, What's your data center look like? You know, what what are your facilities uh, like? And, and those are really important to um, uh, get uh, good, clear answers on. Um, so the the other one, uh, another one has come in, and I, I kind of a, an obvious question, I guess, is how much does it cost? Yeah, great question. Um, so it's simply the cost is simply based on how much data you have to protect. And um, and that's it. That's going to be your your monthly um, your monthly fee. There are no additional costs uh, for anything else in the pricing. So it's not based on you know the number of recoveries. It's not based on uh, the number of uh, declared disasters. Not based on the number of of tests that you perform or how much support that you might need. So it is going to include 24 by 7 support. Um, you can you can test as much as is needed, and all of that is just baked in um, to the cost. So you're also and, going and to have you know all of that maintenance. So oh, go ahead. Well, and I, I was just going to say, Carla, that I, I think that that is that kind of a uh, pricing model is really critical as we talk about using it uh, using the service for more than just disaster, right? If if I'm going to if you're going to charge them every time they spin up uh, a, a VM because they want to do a, you know, a, a maintenance on, on one of their systems, it doesn't become as attractive. But that flat pricing, really, you're really saying, hey, use it for, for other stuff, right? Exactly, right. We don't charge for any extra add-ons. So supports included, product updates included, hardware maintenance included, software warranty included, um, 
and I'm happy. So I, I I'm happy to put you in touch as well with um, one of our account managers to to do a sizing exercise and essentially determine how much data you have and, and how much you'll you'll want to protect that way. Yep, exactly. Um, so let's see the uh, a, a, well my. Uh, Guru of webinars uh, who works for us uh, reminded me that we actually have a webinar on the five disaster recovery questions you're not asking, which are those questions I was talking about. So you can just go back and watch that one, and and you're ready to go. Um, the uh, so we got time for um, a couple more questions here. Here's a good one, and I I'm going to try to paraphrase it because I'm not 100 percent sure uh, what it's saying here, but if the backup I guess what they're asking, Carla, if the backup is happening every 15 to 30 minutes, isn't there a really high requirement of storage, and doesn't this become a, like a heavy solution um, to execute? But I think that kind of goes to the the what I talked about earlier with the the cloud forcing you guys to be innovative and efficient. So talk about how that process works a little bit. Yeah, so it, it sounds like, and I, I saw that question come through as well, referring to you know cost cost wise is, is my is my cost going to increase? Um, but so so that's that's not the case because um, when it comes to what what you're essentially going to be paying for the solution, it's simply the amount of data that you have, um, and then we do move compute resources to where the data is sitting. We have intelligent cloud spillover that's built in as well. So on, on that on-premise appliance, as you get to you know, data, data limits there, it's going to intelligently spill data over to the cloud. And that's how we can also you know, save, uh, save on, on the, the cost of that storage. Um, so we're essentially using um, intelligent software, and we've removed the bulky hardware costs um, that were typically included in, in those traditional um, backup and recovery solutions. Hopefully that answers yeah. the, your question, and, um, and if not, they, please uh, set, set, send a follow-up as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, um, so here, here uh, you prioritized it before I had a chance to get to it, Carla. Uh, so uh, <laughs> what, what, are the, uh, what are the main industries that use uh, disaster recovery as a service? And, and, and I'll start and let you kind of wrap it up. But, but I, you know, my experience is it's pretty widespread. It's, a, it's really a horizontal product, and you know, almost every industry that I know of uses uh, is a user of grass. Is, is that what you guys see in your customer base? Yes, exactly. So, you know, any company that has critical data is going to need to protect that data. And I don't know a single person or company that doesn't have critical data. Now, what's important to take into consideration is what solution is going to work best for your company. Do you have um, those compliance issues that, you know, you have regulatory frameworks that you need to comply with? Or um, do you have critical data that's going to um, be dependent on any other types of regulations and, and security procedures. So simply asking those questions of, you know, how, how does the solution work and what type of customization and control do I have over the solution is going to let you know if it's going to work for, best for your company. Um, but there is no specific industry that needs or doesn't need disaster recovery. Anyone who has data is going to need protection for that data. Yeah, exactly, and I, I think that's the key thing, right? If you got critical data, that's uh, that's the uh, right. that's the key right. thing, right? right. And, it, and I think what's interesting is your two exactly. services also kind of cover different sized businesses. Like, so you know, it, it's I think it takes a little longer nowadays for a company to have their own internal server resources. They might leverage the cloud for some things, but almost every startup of any size has laptops, and they're passing around critical data there, right? So I think that's a that's a good one two punch for you guys. Uh, so we're just about at the top of the hour, folks. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank you, Carla, for uh, joining us today and uh, giving us some insight into Infrascale and what you guys are doing there. Thank you so much for having me. And then I also want to thank uh, all of you for attending. Uh, again, uh, there's a if you want to send this link to a colleague uh, and have them listen in, there's an email button in the upper right-hand uh, side of your player 
that you can click on and send to them. And also, I want to remind you about the attachments at the bottom. We've got a whole wealth of information uh, down there for you. And then finally, uh, as you leave, if you provide us some feedback, there's a star rating system there, um, uh, five stars being the best. And then there's an area there for comments if you want to uh, give us uh, uh, some kadoos or, or maybe not. And then uh, we'll uh, hope to see you on a future Storage Switzerland webcast. For now, though, I'm George Crump, Lead Analyst for Storage Switzerland. Thank you for joining us.